I want to go to Carl Rove right now, or should I call him Chris Rove? I mean, I just heard the former president call Ron DeSantis Rob. That would be rude. Anyway, Carl, always good to see you. Um, what do you make of the fact that for all the criticism of Ron DeSantis' launch and the Twitter glitches, 8.2 million raised in the first 24 hours? Yeah, well, a pretty impressive amount. In fact, take a look at this. Donald Trump announced on November 15th of, of last year, and in the 136 days between his announcement and the end of the filing period, the finance filing period on March 31st, he raised $17.8 million in 136 days. Ron DeSantis gets in, and the first day he's in, he raises $8.2 million, half as much in one day as Donald Trump raised in 136 days. How much do you want to bet that when we get to the June 30th end of this reporting period, July 15th reports are due, that Ron DeSantis has raised more money than Donald Trump has? You know, let me ask you about these polls. You've always reminded me, Carl, the one that counts is obviously the election, or at least closer to the election. Um, but, but they look very bad for Ron DeSantis and a lot of other Republicans. Even though he, he has, has a good number and a strong second, he's a distant second to Donald Trump right yeah. now. Now, we're going to be cycling through some other polls in other years that showed eventual nominees who weren't doing well. I, right now, for example, Tim Scott, with whom I'll be speaking, getting his thoughts on all of this, he's at 2 percent. But Jimmy Carter wasn't around that, even less when he was running at this point in 1976. So history teaches us be careful about these snapshots once snap their shot. But what do you think of the way the polling is going now? Well, Donald Trump in the polls looks good and looks strong, and he is the, pre the presumptive nominee and, a, and the front runner. But as you say, look, go back to 2008, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani looked like he was going to win the nomination in 2007. It looked like he was ahead and he was going to get the nomination and didn't. Hillary Clinton led in 2007 and 2008, didn't get the nomination. Um, to, a, a month before the 2012 Iowa caucus, Newt Gingrich was leading and Mitt Romney became the nominee. So you're right. You've got to be a little bit careful in reading too much into it, even though President Trump, former President Trump, does have uh, good numbers. While we're talking about numbers, though, there are numbers that this week we're not talking about that really are the most explosive and most important of all. Do you think that Joe Biden is a strong leader in the Fox poll? 33 percent say yes. Republicans only 8 percent. You'd expect that. But think about that. 21 percent, only 21 percent of independents say, I think he's a strong leader. And 36 percent of Democrats say, I don't think he's a strong leader. So it's a real problem for, for, uh, for the, the sitting president to be in that condition and, and too old to be effective. This was the Quinnipiac poll. Republicans, of course, 90 percent of them say he's too old to be effective. But again, independents, 69 percent, nearly seven out of every 10 independents say too old to be effective. And 41 percent of Democrats. If, if I were sitting here looking at, you know, from a completely, you know, I'm, I'm the alien from Mars looking at this. These are the numbers more important than what the Republican presidential sweepstakes are, more important than what the general election sweepstakes are. This is what I'd be looking at, saying there's a fundamental flaw, because who thinks that he is going to look younger and who thinks he's going to look stronger? Joe Biden is in a terrible shape, and the Democrats are, are, will find themselves in a bad place if they end up with him as their nominee. You know, I, I, I'd like to get this on the debt ceiling negotiations, that, but there's a reason for that. I don't want to bore people here, but I found it interesting this go around, and the polls could change, to your point, Carl, but... Uh, Right now, most Americans are aligning themselves with Kevin McCarthy's approach to this, to tie a debt ceiling increase of spending. Uh, they, they like his approach, a, a, a majority of all Americans. And that is very yep. different than prior, you know, debt battles, shutdown battles, where Republicans, had, you know, had their heads handed to them. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, I, 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 I totally agree with you. And think about how this came about. It came about because the Democrats decided, the White House decided, that its approach to the debt ceiling was going to say no negotiations, and it's up to the Republicans to offer a plan. What's your plan? What are your numbers? But offer your plan. And lo and behold, Kevin McCarthy, with a very narrow margin in the House, delivers a plan. And not only that, but the elements of the plan, let's, rec let's, let's claw back the unspent COVID money. Let's have spending restraint where we limit discretionary spending and we put it in place for a number of years. Let's require people who are able-bodied, who are receiving welfare benefits to work. All of these things turned out to be popular. And so the administration put itself in this predicament by starting out by saying, OK, you can't get a plan. It's up to you to come up with numbers. And then when the Republicans did, they, they, they found themselves boxed into a box canyon of their own creation. 
I just wonder what happens if, let's say, we score a deal and we avoid default. But like 2011, we have our credit downgraded. As you know, Carl Fitch Investors already has right. that as, uh, and have, uh, on negative watch. So if that happens, a pox on both parties or any impact at all? What? Well, it, the pox is primarily going to be on the president because the president is the guy in charge. And again, right now, Americans un instinctively understand that we spent too much in 2020, 2021, and 2022, that the government was pouring a, a demand, you know, gasoline on, the, on, on inflationary demand, and that, that we got we to gotta rein it in. And they also understand these deficits are too big and the debt is too large, and we need to put our fiscal house in order. And the Republicans are the people who sound like they want to do that. The Democrats are the people who say, well, let's, let's spend more money uh, on more things that, you know, sound good, but don't particularly have a big impact on the lives of most Americans, except to the degree that they encourage inflation. Um, let me go back to the Republican battlegrounds and, and the states and everything else. We know that a lot of the money that Governor DeSantis is raising wants to focus on and, and refocus and focus again on Iowa. And then in New Hampshire, this is, as you've reminded me, Carla, a state-by-state -state battle. And that's when he says his ground game or the money for that ground game will pay off. What do you think of that? Well, first of all, I think it's a very interesting strategy and really smart because super PACs, this is, we're talking here about the DeSanta super PAC. Right. Most super PACs put most of their money into television advertising. The problem with that is candidates are, under federal law, given what's called the lowest unit rate. They get the cheapest price for a TV ad. A super PAC that comes in and buys the exact same TV ad in exactly the same time on exactly the same station generally ends up paying two or three or four or five times as much for that same spot. So the DeSantis super PAC said, in essence, uh, wigwag signals, if you will, to the DeSantis campaign, we're going to plow most of our money into organizing a ground game, hiring 2,000 organizers to go organize volunteers to go door to door in these early states, knock on doors, make phone calls, build a list of supporters, persuade the undecideds to be for us. And, and we'll do that, and you guys can use your money more effectively on the advertising effort where you get more bang for your buck. If the campaign was spending money on the ground game like the super PAC is, they'd be spending the same amount of money getting the same amount of effect uh, if the if the uh, if the campaign spends its money on television and the super PAC doesn't, the campaign is getting more bang for its buck than the than the super PAC could ever get. You know, I'd like to go back to how the various candidates, Ron DeSantis included, handled Donald Trump. No one has found the successful way to do it, and with the race complete, getting more and more crowded every day, it seems we could be back to or close to the number of Republicans fighting it out for the nomination that we were in 2016. We know famously what happened back then. Donald Trump would pick them off one by one and had an attack strategy that was quite the attack strategy. Ron DeSantis has come out to mention a couple of things to say that Donald Trump isn't the same guy he was in 2015-16 to talk about $8 trillion more in debt, that uh, his default comments and all of that. Um, what, what is the proper attack line here? If you're going to take on Donald Trump, who's proved brilliant at it uh, up until this point, maybe including this point. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, I think it's smart to, to realize people want to know more about who you are and what you're about, what your values are, what your priorities are, what it is that you think you want to do if you were elected president. They need to establish themselves. Anybody who comes out uh, and, and, and starts, you know, taking a two by four to the former president is not going to advance themselves very much. They may hurt the former president, but they people need to know who you are and what you're about. And I think I think, frankly, the two things that are at play here. I think the former president has been too negative on Ron DeSantis in a way that's caused people to scratch their heads and is often childish. You know, Ron Sanctimonious, what the heck does that mean? Uh, and, and, and so I think over the course of time, people will find ways to be critical of the president, and you're starting to see it. I think he spent too much. He said that Mexico, he would build a wall and have Mexico pay for it. He didn't finish the wall, and Mexico never paid a dime. You know, he said he'd do something about China to, to change that trade. He did nothing to, to stop them from stealing our intellectual property. And rather than selling them, you know, tens of billions of dollars of, of farm products, uh, as he claimed, they didn't do, they did, they did a fraction of that. So I think people are going to find ways over the course of time to sort of say, you know what, Mr. President, you're, you're, you, you, we like a lot of what you did, but you failed in some very important ways. And more important than that, I've laid out a vision for the future that causes people to understand I'm looking forward, not backward. All you really seem to care about is, is the 2020 election. And, and we'll see how that works out over time. But, but it, I'm not, I, I think it's a smart move for each of these people, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, 
Ron DeSantis, uh, you know, uh, to come out and sort of say, I'm talking primarily about what I'm about and what I want to do, and I'll re I'll counterpunch when the president, when the former president takes a shot at me, and I'll find some weaknesses in his record that I think I can, I can exploit with 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 voters who are saying, you know what, I like sort of what he did, but I but I really think we ought to turn the page. Uh, it's the best we can do a 78-year-old Republican and an 82-year-old Democrat running against each other. You know, um, it's a big if, but it, 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 if this ends up, you know, Donald Trump doesn't get the Republican nomination and he doesn't throw his support behind whoever is nominated, that could change it. We don't even know if that would even happen. Uh, then what? Well, he can't run as an independent candidate. The, the laws of the states are such that, it, that it's going to be hard to get on the ballot. In but many his states. supporters states, could sit it out, right? They could do that's that. That's right. That's the key. Is the, the yeah. key is does he say, "Don't vote for the Republican"? I'm, you know, and then do people follow him? And yep, that is a that is a risk. But but it, uh, you know, it, it it makes him look small. Uh, if he doesn't win the nomination, it makes him look small. If he then takes that kind of a step, and I'm not certain he wants to be written up in the history books that way. Okay, we'll follow closely. Carl, always learn a lot. Or is it Chris? I can't really. I think it's Carl Rowe. Always good seeing you, Carl. My middle, my middle name is Christian, so you can call me Christian. Fine. That makes it a lot easier for me in the future. Always good seeing you, my go. friend. Thank you very much. Best-selling author, you. former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Carl Rowe. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.